coming up. And I'm really thankful, Philip, for laying that important uh, foundation in my career as an urban designer. So I'm really thankful for that. With this note, I would like to take this opportunity to formally introduce Philip to all of you. Uh, Philip Singleton is a Birmingham, UK-based architect and a member of RIBA since 1989. He has a postgraduate certificate in leadership from Oxford Brooks. He has spent around half of his career in private practice, working for the largest firm in UK and the smallest as a one-man unit. The other half he has focused on advocacy, influencing and commissioning better places. He has been actively practicing as a board member in various organizations such as British Architectural Trust, Graven Hill Village Development Company, Architecture Center Academy, and many more. His vocational work includes winning Ribar Design Awards, running the big city plan in his formative years, Millennium Point in Birmingham as CEO, and the largest self-built project in UK. In London, he was involved with the post-Olympic planning of the eastern region of the city. He spent 11 years as a judge for the Prime Minister's Better Public Building, reviewing, critiquing buildings, bridges, and infrastructure projects across UK. He has presented talks on city planning globally. Later in 2018, Philip decided to pursue his childhood passion for photography by completing his master's in photography from Falmouth University. He is now a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts and associate of the Royal Photographic Society. He now classifies himself primarily as an art photographer with a tuned eye for surface, texture, light, and space. Today, Philip is take us through his journey from being an architect, urban design manager, to becoming a passionate artist. I hereby, Philip, welcome you once again to Navrashna University on the virtual world, and the floor is all yours. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, it's really lovely to be here. And um, all, all of the students online I can't see, uh, welcome to you all. Um, it takes me back to my time at, um, at my university. So um, can I just check um, the, you can see this screen, yeah? Yes, Philip, we can see it. Excellent, that's very really good. Well, so uh, no, really lovely to be here and thanks for the very warm welcome and a very comprehensive review of things. Um, I, I just want to make the point because I make images that uh, we've been talking about this uh, talk for some weeks now, and I've been um, gathering images from all sorts of different places, mostly on the web. So I don't have ownership a lot of, of a lot of these images. There are a lot of other people's work, um, which I'm citing. So um, that's very important that everybody kind of gets that. Um, I, I don't I don't regard myself as an academic, so um, I I will speak probably quite simply in many ways about the, the work that I've done. Um, but what's been very interesting for me. Um, I have never put together a visual record of my work um, since I went to university in the 1980s uh, in Sheffield, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but I think these, these themes come through. So the premise for the talk really is um, I've done many, many different things, but it's founded upon what I would call the DNA of um, the training that you get in architecture, because, you know, you spent seven years of your early life um, studying really, really hard and um, successfully coming out of that and launching yourself into the world. And a lot of people stick into practice and do that for the ne next 40 years. I didn't do that. So um, these are kind of themes, uh, just as a little reminder for you as we go through the tour, because it is a journey and uh, I'll, I'll do my best to uh, remind you of, um, of, of those points as I, as I kind of go through really. Um, so the, I, I found these uh, photographs that I printed in, in a pop-up darkroom in the 1970s. And the reason why I put it on is because that was the house I spent my teenage years in, in Wolverhampton, which is quite near Birmingham, in the centre of the, of the UK. Um, and on the right there, it was my mother that once suggested um, while I was drawing that I should try and train as an architect. I was probably about 15 at the time, and that kind of stuck with me and never left me. And then the bottom left is... Um, a photograph that I took, um, which includes my father, and he was he was um, an amateur photographer. So you can sort of see the roots of where things come from, really. 
I'm not especially uh, obsessed by dates because uh, I'm giving you a flow of a life uh, today. Uh, but these were the, the years that I spent uh, in this place, 1982 to 1988. This is the Arts Tower. Um, which is at the heart of the campus at Sheffield University. And the School of Architecture occupied the top uh, five or six floors of this building. And then the coffee bar was um, in the sort of me museum um, top where you couldn't actually see out uh, behind the sort of louvers at the top of the building there. Um, I thought it was very interesting because you, you could see the whole city there and you could see the weather coming in. And it's, it's quite a good place to, to train as an architect, but also to think about a city because you're looking down on the city with some kind of privilege and elevation. Um, you have to forgive the, the quality of these particular um, photographs here, but um, the, these are glazed images from uh, my thesis scheme, uh, which um, was done in 1988. And this is quite important, I think, because uh, some, some, a lot of my colleagues are doing very enormous urban design studies and others were doing very sizable complex buildings and I was looking I, I went to a historic city Venice um, looked at the Peggy Guggenheim collection uh, which was in a palazzo that was unfinished from I think 1748 from memory um, and, and basically did a proposition by studying the city studying the water's edge and uh, creating a series of sequential spaces outdoor and indoor spaces as, as, a, as a proposition. Um, this is some, somewhat stylized by the, the late 80s in many ways, but um, it was also contextual, which is kind of a fascination I, I've had. And of course, it was a publicly accessible art gallery and a lot of my work, as you'll see, uh, which partly, I suppose, a political belief in, in access and openness and democracy and space that's shared and accessible for as many people as possible, really. So that's kind of the roots of that. Um, I worked briefly for BDP Building Design Partnership, and they, I think they still employ more, more architects in the UK than anywhere else, but it's a multidisciplinary firm. So I actually got to expose to how engineers, surveyors, quantity surveyors, uh, services people kind of work together and, and indeed landscape architects and um, did my final qualification there, but then moved to Birmingham. So this was 1990 and worked for Associated Architects who are a very design orientated practice. Um, some slightly fuzzy images here, but um, on site, I, I um, looked after the, the contract for uh, designing a theatre, which again, um, this is for a public school, uh, so privately educated, um, strange kind of way we label things in the UK, uh, but nevertheless, a place where the community could go and visit and, 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 and see performances, uh, and, and again, as part of education. And then uh, sticking with education, this is quite a about four years of my life was spent on this building, uh, right from the very idea that we, we, we should revive the school of uh, jewellery, uh, so design and making, so that the, 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 the true um, maker space actually, um, from, from you know, understanding metals and uh, other materials, but actually making them. So that it goes through from an HND all the way through to um, a bachelor's and a master's degree in this building. The two buildings on the right, uh, Victorian and Edwardian um, listed, so a statutory listing, so the government held list of uh, buildings to preserve and had to negotiate how we could revive, extend, put a new building to the left. This is 1992 to 94. Um, and inside in certain atrium, so the whole teaching space became much more open and transparent from the Victorian precedent they had. So reuse the buildings, again, an open education uh, space for for people so you can see some of the themes there and this is a much more modest building this is out of the city center again in Birmingham it was an old snooker hall and we converted it into um, an art center for the local community which was very much um, a blackened uh, minor minority uh, ethnic um, part of the city so this was um, an art center where a performance and and you know, collective gatherings could happen for that community. So again, reuse of a building and, and very accessible um, and actually quite modest really in terms of budget and scale. I decided um, after six or seven years in that particular practice to set up on my own. So I ran my own business uh, as, as a practitioner uh, for a number of years. And um, this is a, a, a very simple photograph 
Uh, but again, it was a bungalow um, in, in quite a, a rather nice leafy setting in a suburb of Birmingham. But I extended it, you can just see a hint of what I did on the left there by putting in a new steel frame, opening up the, uh, the, 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 the public part of the building to, to allow them to go into the private parts where the, where the, the, the um, uh, surgery rooms were effectively. So um, again, kind of thematic when I look back at, uh, at how that kind of manifested itself. But while I was practicing on my own, um, I found that quite tough. Um, win winning work, dealing with clients, gathering the money, sorting out design teams, coordinating things from, from a bedroom in my house. So um, I got increasingly interested in the why things happen, why buildings occur, why projects are projects. And um, at the same time, um, the Blair government came in in 97 and launched with uh, Richard Rogers, Lord Rogers, who you will have all heard of, who was the, the chair of a group that created this uh, document called Towards an Urban Renaissance, um, because Rogers has always believed in the vitality of cities. And um, this was a very important document that was done at government level, so it's kind of a policy statement. And that followed through um, with funding into government departments. And also that started to, to get out into how cities and places are managed through what we call local authorities in the, in the UK. So local government, basically, that, that's in that tier that you see around you, that, that, that the bit of government you kind of uh, witness as a, as a resident, as a citizen. And um, at the same time, I, I was looking at um, the... the, the uh, formation of something called an architecture centre for the West Midlands region, where, where I'm speaking to you from now. And it was called MADE, Midlands Architecture and the Design Environment. So that sat underneath of something called CABE, which is Commission for Architecture and the Built Environment, which came from that urban renaissance policy. So both, um, there was a circle of people that were advocating for good buildings, better places, better spaces, good commissioning, um, best practice, understanding precedents and citing all of those kind of things. So this is one project. This was, this was before we used to do digitize a lot of things. This is only uh, 20 years ago, but it's amazing how the record of what we did is not very present on the web at all. And I managed to find one document to show you here. So this was something we were commissioning with an agency, which was youth space. So, so shelters in parks and public spaces for young people to be able to sort of gather and um, again in very open democratic spaces and um, create really interesting fun shelters for, for them to be protected from the British weather basically in the outdoors. Um, so it's just one example of a project. So I got increasingly interested in where ideas come from, where money comes from, and particularly what I call the levers that are pulled that actually make a difference very, very early on because what, was what I call design governance, which is the way I talk about it these days, if, if that doesn't exist at a board level or a, a project seniority level, if it's all about the money and the outcome and the profit that's going to be made, if you don't inject somebody with intelligence and experience and the ability to communicate and advocate for the quality of what you're doing, the qualitative picture, the qualitative frame, in which you're working, then you, um, I think you are very unlikely to procure and to make a great space. Um, so I think that's that's kind of a really uh, interesting point that I that, that's pervaded a lot of my thinking uh, since then, really. Um, so I wasn't that long get made, and my profile went up in the region from nobody really knowing me to suddenly running an organization across the region, which was about advocacy and therefore a lot of communication. And I, I um, applied for a job to become the first city design advisor for Birmingham City Council, which was mentioned in the introduction. So it started there in 2003. So Beata and I must have met only a year later when I started. So I, I was working at the, the level of a doctor's surgery in my own business and then working in an advocacy organization. And then suddenly thrust before me were schemes of this kind of scale. So this is the east side of Birmingham, which was a big regeneration area, which was which was after a political move to, to break down the, the concrete sort of motorway that surrounded the city, which I'll talk about again in a little while. Um, 
And suddenly with, with developers and their architects and their master planners and their urban designers and their landscape architects would all get in a room and say, you know, these are people with millions of pounds of investment at stake and, and wanted to um, talk about the disposition of, of buildings and elements to this, this part of the city. Um, so, uh, you know, I had to get geared up in my, my mind to work at this kind of scale, um, which, uh, so you see the, the drawing on the bottom right and the classic kind of CGI kind of efforts that, that you see from above. So negotiating how these buildings interface with the existing context, with the canal side, with um, various other, other elements around the place. But the talking about policy with the, the urban renaissance, the, um, the the thing I'd like to mention here is, is that we drafted a number of policy documents, which is very important in the, the town planning decision making process. Again, some of the levers that you can impose upon that. So there have been some um, rather inappropriate developments in the jewelry quarter where there's 74 or so statutory listed buildings, which I mentioned. In, in fact, the School of Jewellery is right at the core of this, this part of the, the city. Um, and, and, and basically, um, we, we, my team created this document uh, that, that actually set a standard of uh, design and reference points to pick up the heritage. So it absolutely embraced contemporary thinking and contemporary design. In fact, the School of Jewellery did that, but that always referenced the kind of scale, the texture, the spaces, the way that the proportionality of things such as windows or wall and, and you can see little examples on the bottom right there where you know there's a whole there's a whole variety and in fact the variety is very key but actually you know policy is very important so that was a policy around controlling things this was a policy lighting places which was about um advocating for great things you know let, let's let's do things better uh, and let's almost have some fun so this was um mapping the, the city centre, looking at gateways, towers, uh, canal side, and it was about safety as well as light, uh, but very much about the evening economy, because obviously in the winter in the UK, the evenings, the nights are long and dark, and actually light is part of what really, I think, inspires a place and, and can, can really make it quite distinctive as well. So that was another adopted policy. The other thing I did for the, for the time I was there at the, at the City Council for seven years was I chaired the uh, design review panel, uh, which is something that I'm still on a couple of panels uh, regionally and nationally in the UK, um, where we uh, to critique, hopefully at the very earliest stage, again, one of the levers that you can pull is, is actually getting expertise on the panel. Um, and, and again, very multidisciplinary expertise. So landscape, uh, engineering, uh, developers, architects, um, and, and indeed planners um, to, to uh, analyze the setting of a building, the proposition and all the rest of it. So this was a building designed by Glenn Howells, uh, which is a practice that's kind of sat, sat in many parts of my career and still does. Um, so this was a, 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 the last of the developments at Brindley Place, which was a, a good urban design project in extension of the city to the west uh, as opposed to the east that I showed you earlier. So this went through the design review panel. And in fact, the building did mould as a result of the critique that we gave. That we gave. This also happens to be um, a Glen Howells building. Um, Glen's based in Birmingham and London. And this was uh, an office block um, that has been changed entirely into residential. It's known as the Rotunda uh, for fairly obvious reasons. It was one of the first tall buildings in, in Birmingham city centre and it still sits there without many other tall buildings around it. And um, th again, this came through the planning process that was, I was closely involved with as to how this uh, proposition um, could take place. Now, this is interesting because um, this is the, what I call the civic core of the city in Birmingham. Um, there's a performance building that looks like a Greek temple. And then you behind that, you've got a, a mixed use building from the Victorian area, which is actually the, the civic offices and the council house, but also the art gallery, the museum and art gallery. Um, so very significant building, but the square pale building in the middle is done by John Maiden, who was very uh, prolific in the uh, 60s, 70s and early 80s in, in Birmingham. Um, this was a Louis Kahn kind of inspired building. This is the central library and it's kind of inverted pyramid with a sort of light well through the middle of it. And an actually very interesting building 
there were two issues with it. Firstly, it was quite badly maintained. And secondly, um, it, it, as an urban design piece, it actually caused a blockage. Um, it, I often talk about urban design as being the skeleton of, a, uh, of the city. So the form of the, uh, of the city uh, takes up that sort of skeletal formation. And this was like a broken joint. This is where you couldn't flow. The, 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 effectively, this, it, it just didn't work. So it got in the way of people movements in particular. And cities only work well if people can move around them at ease. So this, this actually got demolished and there's been a new development that's still going on being built now. Um, but this, this, this project returns to my life in, a, in, a, in a, a little later on, I'll explain it. So I worked with the chief librarian uh, while I was at the city council and one evening over, over some wine, we actually shortlisted an amazing list of, of um, architects uh, on the, uh, which should be globally recognised. I won't name them all now, but there was a little bit of an outsider that came along, and we interviewed. We interviewed her. This was Francine Huben, who runs Mecanu, uh, based in in Rotterdam in the, in the Netherlands, and we uh, commissioned her to do this library. This was 180 million pounds worth of that's UK pounds of um, investment, which is which is a lot of money uh, for any local authority to invest. So this is the new library located about 200 meters away from the one that I showed you a minute ago. Um, and again, we have a building that's publicly accessible, um, public facing of great quantum. And the things I'm proud, most proud of with this is the roof gardens that you see on the, the right hand side there. There's two proper roof gardens. There's a lot of tokenistic um, roof gardens expressed, but they, they were really rather lush. And, and, and you look out from two different levels across the city and they're incredibly popular. But also you, you see the sort of dynamic way you can move around and through uh, this building. Um, so I'm very, very pleased with that. Now in the introduction, um, this was mentioned as well. This is the most significant thing that I did at the council. So the last three years I was there, we launched this thing called the Big City Plan, um, which is around, you know, livable, connected, authentic, created and smart. Um, and basically, um, the, the red area was the was really the city core, and that had been defined by a concrete motorway, and it was that motorway that that um, allowed the, the demolition of that allowed the east side to uh, to to be developed over here, um, and um, and that basically that had been a restraining collar that had uh, fixed things in the city core. That was gradually being taken away, and then these quarters. Uh, became much more sort of interconnected and accessible, but we needed to plan that. And I was fascinated by the way the Dutch, uh, particularly around uh, Amsterdam, which obviously is a growing city, they sort of take a big plan and take a quarter of the time and really invest in it and get the private sector going with it, put in the infrastructure and so on. So we were doing this big plan for Birmingham. So you can sort of see a bit of an aerial view there the, the sort of the sort of density of the, the city it's not super dense by any means in global senses but um quite a sort of sprawl of things and we were trying to sort of bring order and um legibility and logic to the way that it could be expanded out so we had property advisors urban designers um cycling and walking experts so we had a lot of different people in a big piece of consultancy we'd also commissioned a, a digital model you can see on the bottom of the screen there that actually demonstrates that that footprint area that i was talking about it, previously it was an 80 hectare core and what we were addressing here was an 800 hectare footprint so that that as a as a percentage is around is a that is a thousand percent change so it was an enormous exercise in thinking about the, the the change in the city, this is just one page from a, a large document, and it's being refreshed now. Actually, they got a twenty forty plan. This was looking uh, uh, from uh, two thousand and seven eight for another fifteen twenty years thereafter. So, councils love refreshing these things, and I think what it misses is that is the continuity that's very very important. This is very topical walkability, because in the COVID times, m many many more people are moving around. Uh, cycling or walking around everywhere around their neighborhoods and around their city they're avoiding public transport um, so what we were saying is the bones of things were there 20 years previous 
was getting better, but it needed to get a lot better. So how do you plan for all of that? Now, I'm giving you here one example of that and, and how we, we kind of didn't learn from history, um, not straight away, really, because this was a Victorian version of what's called New Street Station, which is there are two lines that connect Birmingham to London, the capital city. Um, and uh, this is the primary one. And it, because Birmingham is a relatively young city, it, it's uh, unlike some of the historic places in like um, Cheltenham and Bath and uh, Oxford, a place like that in the UK, where the, the stations were often displaced to the outside because they the Victorian expansion happened post the history. Whereas in Birmingham, it's right in the middle of the city. So it has an incredibly big impact upon the, uh, the legibility and the moving around the city. So in the Victorian times, you had these two huge barrel vaulted arches. You could move through the middle east-west. You could also, on, via bridges, go north-south. So this is what we, we did in the 1960s and 70s. This is, this is several versions of this across, across. We did this with shopping. We did it with other stations. But this is a really terrible example, actually, of putting huge pancakes of concrete across the tracks and then creating a shopping center that's entirely inward looking above all those tracks and this this existed for sort of 30 40 years this is one of the busiest stations in the uk you can see the tracks below there are about 13 platforms and partly as a result of the big city plan and the thinking and looking at sort of architecture and urban design we did this slightly wider view but if i take you back and just just look at this um this bridge across here, and there's no public access across here or across here. And then when you can see here, we, we expanded hugely the footprint of the outdoor space across here, through here with a green wall, and also all the way through there. And then internally, you could not have to buy a ticket, you can move north south across the across this, this big piece of the city uh, through the through the drawing here. And then you go off side to side to buy your tickets to access the trains. So suddenly this building became um, a piece of as a public forum, uh, externally and internally. And also a, a department store was, was landed on top as well, which uh, wasn't previously functioning in the in Birmingham. So it was a, a master stroke. It took many, many years to actually, you know, build, um, but it made a, a huge change in the city. And, and I think um Again, it's democratic, it's open space, there's nobody stopping you moving in and out of there. But of course, the most democratic spaces you get are, uh, you know, parks and streets and squares. So this, um, I showed you one of the first projects I dealt with was, was, was Eastside and um, the big master plans for Eastside. Now, the, the building on the left here and the building, this huge building here with 150 metre facade is Millennium Point. And um, this was the first building uh, that was built um, in this regeneration area. The city core is over is at the very top there. So we ran a competition. This was after the big city plan. We ran a competition to um, kind of demonstrate how we would implement the big city plan. Um, and Patel Taylor won this one. And um, it's a fantastic combination of hard space, soft space, um, vertical planting, a very very long uh, water space with with a series of trees sorry a series of bridges uh, crossing it uh, there are intimate spaces there's open event spaces there's pieces of history with a, a pub at the edge and things like that as you can see it also works at night time so very very proud of that and millennium point will come back in a minute in in the in the discussion i'm having today so we also, again, back in the heart of the jewellery quarter, which is a very important part of the city, I've mentioned a couple of times already, uh, we ran a competition, again, a design competition. This is all about design governance again. Let's get the best thinking for the best square within the budget that we can, and let's, let's acquire this car parking space. Let's convert it into a space for people. Again, this is brilliant for events, um, for happenings, for display and for picnicking and just hanging around. But there were, what I like about the materiality and the subtlety of um, texture is you see on the right there a little detail where a pavement meets a metal plate and the, the imposition of a quote and a piece of poetry. I think that really makes harmony in the space and distinctiveness and, and beauty, really. This is almost the peak of my exposure 
in a public way because um, the business paper uh, used to run an annual review of influential people in the city in the top 50. And I was 26 in that list um, while I was away on holiday in, in Spain, actually. I, I found this out. Uh, so people had a party. I wasn't there. Um, but um, that was that was kind of um, the heyday of influence. I'm, I'm, I, 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 I run a much more modest life now these days. So that was the end of my my time in Birmingham, where the the, the influence over things, uh, when I look back, actually um, was was quite significant, I suppose. So I moved uh, for a short while to work in East London. Uh, London made of many many boroughs. This is Newham. Uh, Newham and uh, two or three other boroughs uh, bounded the Olympic Park uh, for 2012. So I was there a couple of years before the Olympics happened. And um, we we worked with a with a firm that I'm very fond of called Studio Agro West. Um, they used to work with Will Orsop. They've been independent for many many years now. So um, basically, what we what we were doing here was dressing a space again, public space, dressing it in preparation for the Olympics because uh, the uh, the the original Stratford shopping centre, East London Stratford, not Shakespeare Stratford. Um, was pretty tired, but basically we were looking at the highways and the public space that actually ringed the whole of that centre. And it's right next to the tube station, the underground station that would have taken a lot of athletes and visitors and it would have been on the world stage. So we actually created this kind of ephemeral structure that made this wrapper around here and they're kind of fish-like forms um, as a kind of, you know, relatively temporary uh, installation. So very, very fond of that piece of work. But we were also doing a really serious piece of mapping. So the River Thames uh, had, a, had a tributary called the Lee. So the Lee Valley, the River Lee, actually went through the Olympic Park on the top of the drawing there. And what we were doing was investing in walkways, uh, side sidewalks and uh, river crossings all the way from the river right up into the Olympic Park. So this is something that's prepared for the Olympics, thrived during the Olympics, but was also a legacy. So again, a public space manipulation um, for everybody to use. We also sold a piece of land to Siemens so they could build a building for the Olympics, an exhibition building for, for public people to access. So I mentioned Millennium Point. So I came back to Birmingham and um, started my own consultancy business, which I still have and I still run that. Um, and I do my photography through that, which I'll talk about in a minute. So. This is Millennium Point, um, and uh, this was um, we. I, I created an art strategy for this building because, again, it was a public building. It was op it's open twenty four seven, you know, seven days a week, um, and we we were introduced to a, a Pritzker winning uh, composer called David Lang from New York, and David came over and launched the world premiere of a piece called Crowd Out, um, where a thousand people sang in the atrium here. And there's various references online to that. So it's kind of the peak of my, my time there. But we also ran a cinema and not entirely appropriate to this talk, I suppose. But I was very proud of one or two things that we did. So we, we used the money as a charity and launched a, a sponsorship annually for a student to study uh, in the local university. And this was the first winner um, a few years ago of, of that prize. So that was a, a lovely thing to do, again, socially. But I also found that we had some land spare, kind of spare, you know, land that was not properly planned. Um, you get this with object buildings. Millennium Point was enormous object building designed by Nick Grimshaw. And um, it had some space. And I, I persuaded the board that, because I was chief exec here, that um, we, should, we should think about how we might reuse that. And I, again, I used the competition uh, route um, an ideas competition made it very clear it was just about ideas the, the 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 funds were modest but we did pay people to create six ideas and it got covered by the architects journal in the UK um, I, I had an arrangement with them so they got exclusivity on it and um, we started to the nice thing about this it started a conversation about what could happen with this this piece of land so this is actually what did happen we sold it to the local university and they absolutely filled it to the very edges 
um, with, with a building that I'm very pleased with, uh, which was designed by Field and Clegg Bradley, FCB Studio. Um, very, very clever, um, very sustainable rooted firm. And this was a conservatoire, for, so this, the teaching of, of music and song uh, at the university. So um, a really super asset on that land. So this, this was part of the sort of influencing of things. And um, yeah, whilst other people developed it, other people designed it, again, it, it happened because we were pushing that land to be used. So after four and a half years there, I went to work in Oxfordshire. So right in the sort of rural heart of the UK. Uh, halfway between Birmingham and London. Uh, and this was what we call brownfield land uh, in, in our planning terms. In other words, land that wasn't just green farmland, it had had another use. So this was um, military, uh, Ministry of Defence, so mil military use, uh, which no longer needed to serve that purpose. So we created a master plan. This is actually, again, by Glenn Howell. So um, I, I hadn't commissioned him. See, he'd been commissioned before I arrived, but it was interesting that the same people kind of crisscross through your life. It's kind of quite extraordinary in many ways. So this was the largest self-build project in the UK. Um, so you, you'll see some sort of larger communal buildings, so a school we have to build, but there's 1800 plots around here and you can see you can see on the master plan there. But we, we actually then worked at a micro scale. So you get a plot passport for a person that was buying a piece of this land from us and then building their own house upon it. So this is the parameters in which they could uh, build their land. So um, whatever you think about the architecture there, people were doing their own thing, um, but you can see they, they had some fun building their own kind of homes. I was there for a fairly short period of time. So I came back to, to Birmingham and uh, this again is public space, uh, the most democratic space you can get. So this was a master plan for the very, very civic, sorry, the, the commercial core of Birmingham. So we used a firm called Broadway Malian. They are global, uh, very good practice actually when, when it comes to urban design and so on. And we analyzed primary streets, back streets, side streets, picked up the quality of those streets and so on and so on. And then picked out a number of the key key streets, uh, one over here, which is demonstrated here, and one uh, over here, which was uh, called Cornwall Street. So we're actually largely pedestrianising those those streets, although traffic can still service the buildings, but revolutionising the, the the street materials, the surface materials, putting in trees, uh, using um, sustainable urban drainage systems, and so on. So. Um, this was working with a business improvement district uh, at the heart of, of the city. But actually, they're very topical. I, I came back to work with them in the middle of last year because they had a very urgent series of projects. So um, in response to the COVID crisis, so this is where uh, bars and cafes, coffee houses, restaurants, the, the clientele often need to be outside and socially distanced two metres apart. So we, we created these micro parks we call them parklets, um, which were a standard module of uh, timber framing, heavily planted uh, and safe. And um, these, these have been used across the centre of the city. So we're, we're right up to date now. Um, this year uh, and the last couple of years, I've been working on and off with a property developer uh, in central London and helping him with commissioning skills so architects planning consultants cost consultants uh around um a proposition so i've got masked out here uh because i can't be explicit but there's a little sketch that i did around uh what could happen on on one site in, in a central location in london london to me is very interesting because you know the, the values of land and property are 10 sometimes 100 times what i'm used to being in birmingham because it's a global city and it just is what it is. So, you know, if everything is rather a different dynamic down there. So, you know, working, working with a the developer there. However, I still really, really enjoy working at a much more kind of intimate scale. So this is, this, this is, these are work in progress uh, photographs, hence the OSB board you can see there. Uh, this is my own house and uh, where I'm speaking from at the moment. And uh, I've been working on 
uh, working with the builder uh, and creating this fairly fairly standard solution, but um, quite compact and quite complex in many ways. And this is still an unfinished space, but I have a seven a seven meter long wall on the left there, and I've been collecting work for that wall. Uh, so that has a, a gallery hanging system. So this is a mini a mini gallery in my own house, basically, uh, which is nearly coming together. But um, I'm thinking about how I might use that space uh, to work with artists more and more. We're nearly finished on architecture. So this is what I do at the weekends. Uh, we rent a garden away from our houses, three of us, and um, we're slowly but surely building an entirely timber structure that's elevated above a floodplain. Um, and uh, we have a Ralph Erskine inspired uh, bay window here from the box in the woods in Stockholm. Um, that, that I visited once and that was that was gorgeous. So this is me here. Uh, we're building building this structure, uh, which we're, we're very, very proud of. So um, I see we, I've been talking for a while. So hopefully um, this this will prove um, the, the sort of last bit of the story, really. So on the left, you, you saw my mother very early on. These were drawings she did when she was studying art to become an art teacher. Um, in the 1950s and early 60s and I found her portfolio just a few weeks ago and I picked out one of these images and then I went out inspired by her drawings uh, with my camera and uh, you know take images like this to um, respond basically which is part of the concept of my work but while I was um, studying with Falmouth University we were encouraged to um, find a way of um, showing our work so I managed to persuade an art gallery in Birmingham to um, show the culmination of two, two years of part-time study for the master's degree in photography at Falmouth University, but we were learning um, remotely. So pre-COVID digital learning, which was um, interesting actually as precedent for where a lot of people are these days. So these are stills from the uh, exhibition I had. I was working with concrete and I was putting images onto concrete uh, but I was also working in, with projection, which you can see on the bottom right there. <clears throat> so I was deliber deliberately exploring the medium of experiencing still imagery. Um, but of course, concrete, modular concrete, goes back to the disciplines of the architectural training. So I think the way I frame photographs, the way I seek them, um, I think is influenced by drawings and working with buildings and materiality and so on and so on. So I think that that DNA point I was making really is very manifest to me visually with, the, with this kind of work. So my theme with a lot of my work, the conceptual theme behind it, is I seek out buildings that have had a particular life, but the humans have gone. Um, so in this series I show you here now, um, the top one is a banking hall where the vaults were. I managed to get access for a short period of time with my camera and tripod and, and, and take those images. The bottom one is in Coventry, another city near Birmingham, where the, the huge, enormous printing um, house for a newspaper was abandoned in a very sudden way. That, that's a boardroom at the bottom there. It's just like somebody's got out of that seat only the day before, and yet actually it had been empty for quite a few years. So this kind of fascinates me, the sort of legacy of people having um, simply left spaces. And often these spaces are about to be grabbed or knocked down or rejuvenated and repurposed, reappropriated. Some are obviously in a, a greater level of decay than others. But again, you can sort of, some of them feel quite cinematic. Series of spaces here, so doorways and frames leading from one space to another to another. It actually looks quite sort of finished, but actually if you look closely and gaze at the photograph, you see a deteriorated ceiling, you see detritus on the floor, you see terrible electrical installations, and it kind of evokes something uh, beyond the slickness that you get from the kind of normal architectural um, photography. So uh, right at the beginning of 2020, um, I was obviously going home-based more, remotely working, so I built a studio in my garden um, and I built the furniture in that studio. Um, and this is a maker space as well as a little photographic studio. So I, I use 
uh, concrete molds for concrete testing that you get on building sites. So this is 150, 150, 150 cube. Um, and inside that cube, I now encapsulate and entomb things. Um, so this is another piece of crisscrossing points from my career. Do you remember I talked to you about half an hour ago about that central library that we had to demolish for um, town planning and urban design reasons? Uh, I've managed to get 40 kilograms of shards of the concrete from that building demolition. And I have those in my studio and I'm very slowly casting each of those shards within resin. And then implanted within that resin, there's also a photograph. So there's a, a deliberately crumpled photograph uh, here and here of that building uh, from an archive that I then took an image of from the 1972 opening of that building. And then what I then do, I extract those casts out of that mold. And then in this instance, um, I have then effectively made them into a photograph by shooting them in my studio. And ironically, I've never sold any of my resin work, but I have sold images made in the studio of the resin, of the images, of the shards. So there's kind of a sort of interesting irony there. But tangibility um, and the materiality of the image making has turned into sculpture for me. So I, I've almost inverted the concrete application of images to now a, a sort of translucent textual form. Um, there's another example here using a, a smaller mould, but again a concrete testing mould, uh, where I entomb and freeze the moment of decay, in this instance a series of roses, into this slightly kind of crude resin box and you can see the sort of jaggedness of the resin around the edges which I like because it gives you that sort of sharpness and textural feel it's not highly polished which reminds me of the sort of the way I like to work because life isn't polished and beautiful and slick it's actually quite rough and formed but I think the, the there's a metaphor here for what a photograph is which is capturing a split second in time of the photographer's gaze or working with the community or a subject or a building and, and this is doing the same so the decay is frozen and uh, and kind of finished so i've published uh, zines around this kind of work um for um people to have in the uk i run an instagram account um almost daily i attempt to um put up an image my dog appears on there in quite a few places as he's often out with me when i call it my perambulations around a place and that's my last slide. Um, it's a piece of architecture, the Victorian architecture, um, disused. And I took this view of the window and the, the, the veneer of the window is kind of fascinating. But there's just a hint of architecture lit by the sunshine uh, just beyond there. So you kind of, um, it's a summary of my whole career in one shot. So there you go. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Philip. I think uh, it was, I think, an amazing journey. And uh, in fact, a lot of uh, few memories were revived as well. Because uh, when you were talking about Birmingham, and you were taking through the East Side Regeneration and Jewelry Quarter. I just remembered as an intern, I worked a little bit on the Jewelry Quarter as well. And the new station work had also started, I think, when we were, I was still around, I think, that time. So I think it was uh, very interesting in the way that you started thinking and how your thought process actually is connected and ties, the thread ties your thoughts through. And I really like the term you used, DNA of an architect. And I think how it connects your thoughts, even if you keep shifting from one uh, discipline to the other and they are not different because they were the same person your inbuilt dna is same and you are you're comprehensively still thinking about everything in whatever you do and i think that's a very very um i think uh, <laughs> interesting way of looking at things and um i think we can open it up for questions uh pratish uh, would you like to we can start with you yeah, maybe uh, uh, Thanks, thanks, Phillips, for doing this. I think uh, it's so wonderful to 
not only see the project that you have done and as Advita was saying, to see a whole journey of, a, of an architect. And I think it's very inspiring for our students to really understand that um, uh, being an architect is not just about designing pretty buildings, but as an architect, you develop uh, a critical ability to, to kind of, uh, or an ability to look at the society, uh, to develop a kind of a speculative critique of the world we inhabit. I mean, I like those keywords of, uh, you know, I think students should take note of the word like democratic spaces, even when you're talking about architecture and, and a kind of a concern there. And in some sense, it's, 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 I really wanted to thank you to bring a whole cross section of your career rather than just a portfolio of work. Uh, I, had a, I had a question more like a observation and I was very fascinated by that railway station project. And uh, what we did notice in this project was very typical of what happened in the 60s and 70s when you had these uh, high modernist concrete blocks that were laid out as public infrastructure, more uh, using public money. Uh, and uh, they were, by their very nature, sometimes obstructive, uh, sometimes uh, uh, very, very hard on public life. They almost sometimes fragmented the city. And then comes this very amazing project. I mean, I would have loved to see more about the project. It's a huge leap of faith to come up with a project that creates a whole new public realm that opens up the building. And I like the word you used, people could walk through without even paying anything. I'm just wondering, because in, in our country, we are at this stage right now where we have a lot of these modern edifices that needs to be questioned, not dismantled really, but worked with. How, how was the consensus created for this kind of a project? Were there public consultation? Were there media reporting? Um, it's, it, it's not an easy project to pull off because usually the tendency is to demolish everything and do something afresh, but to work with something existing and yet create a public space. I was just curious about that project. I, I, it's a fascinating question. Um, and and uh, it, it's a very complicated series of things that you you provoke with your question really but i think this the simple answer is with that particular um project it was it was relatively easy to get consensus on it because whilst it was probably shiny and lovely when it was first opened um you know it was astonishing that you know they'd taken away <laughs> all those those barrel vaulted roofs but basically it was to flatten it and then and then create commercial space on top so there was a commercial imperative to do that 1960s proposal and then of course that that shopping center was then bought by somebody that was then making money from it so the the um, cpo the compulsory compulsory purchase order powers which allows the local authority to acquire uh, at a certain cost and that had to be all implemented so the main objector was the was the owner of that shopping center you know because that firm was making a lot of money from the rents in, in the but nevertheless it was a terrible passenger experience and a terrible urban experience so the community at large were were behind it and therefore you know there was a lot of consultation but we it was funded by central government so there was that liaison there as well that had to go on it wasn't it couldn't be funded locally it cost over half a billion pounds um you know five or six years to, to complete so that the scale was enormous i think what was much more controversial and remains so in the memory of the city, and I feel very torn by this myself, is, is that library, because that actually, if it had been maintained uh, and you could have possibly worked with it, which I think is another question behind your point, is could we have addressed the urban, urban design issues, the space and the landscape that the building sat upon and restructured some of that, but actually left this piece above hovering there um, and maintained it properly because actually there were, I've got some photographs when it was vacated which I didn't think I could squeeze in today but there was cathedral like spaces and gorgeous modernist spaces um, and that's now dust you know it is dust so you know um, our memories have gone with that dust the place has gone with the dust and 
I now much more personally, uh, well, you can see in my work, I'm memorialising that library in in the resin work. However, uh, I was partly culpable around the, the levers that we were pulling to make sure that it couldn't get preserved, it wasn't going to get knocked down to allow the development to happen. So long answer to your question, but, you know, I, I am much more of the mind these days to attempt to work with a grain, work with a community, work with an understanding of what's what we have for social reasons, but not least for sustainable and energy reasons as well. Yeah, and, and thanks, Philips, and thanks for, you know, bringing this whole question of memorializing uh, buildings that, that are not there anymore. And I, I found it to be a very, very fresh way, very uh, interesting way of uh, making a case about being careful with what exists around us and trying to reinterpret, reuse and find meanings to it. So I think it is not simply, I, I think it goes beyond your own, your own experience. Uh, it carries in some sense lessons for what we should be doing from now on. Yes. It's a provocative art, art initiative. You know, it's, 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 I never thought by you know, encasing a concrete block, I can actually invoke so much memory and so much emotional response from some, someone to actually take them back in time. It, it's quite, quite an interesting something that you have there. I have here, look, this um, a tiny shard. Oh, wow. It, one of my original um, photographs there. So of that of that building, so it become and that that's actually very slim as well. It's not a full cube, so it becomes, you know, I have that next that's to me. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks for this. Thank you. It makes us wonder and think. Thanks. But I'm sure there are other people who would like to ask questions. Or I think people, uh, uh, students on YouTube can uh, WhatsApp their questions to Pragya or Advaita. The rest who are present in the Zoom room can ask their questions directly. Yes. Uh, Neha, Pragya, Kronali, Anjal, Ashna, anyone has. Uh, thanks, Philip. Thanks for a wonderful uh, uh, talk. Um, I could see that the connection, I mean, in, in the manner in which you look at uh, life in general, you know, the birth. Uh, and, and continuity and decay and, uh, you know, something which, which, which has to start again. And I could see that uh, in the manner in which you look at life, I think, and architecture and also the cities. So I really found it very, very fascinating. Uh, I also found very fascinating the kind of work in urban design and the manner in which, uh, you know, you've been looking at the cities and regenerating these spaces. Um, so uh, and, and many interesting takeaways, actually. Uh, and uh, I think at times very hard decisions have to be made to, to create something new. I think that's one, one very big takeaway, which, uh, uh, which, which, which are for me in this case, that to, to, make, to create a, a better city, we have to at times make very hard decisions and to create something better. Uh, so that's very interesting. Uh, and another thing which I really uh, liked about the same project, uh, the, the station uh, project, is that how we can look at the role of these public buildings in, in, uh, in its multiplicity. What else can they offer? So a, a project need not be just limited to the, uh, the utility it has to serve, but it can do much more. And that's what I think is a, is a very important takeaway in terms of public project. Mm. Uh, one thing that I would like to, when I, which I got very fascinated with, uh, a very small intervention which you showed for a flick of a second of that parklets. Uh, oh, yeah. That. Those are small yeah. gardens which were installed in the city. And I was uh, more curious to know about it. I mean, what was it about? I know you said that it was something to do with this COVID times. And what were your experiences regarding that? <laughs> well, again, I think the... Um... This is really it's very interesting because uh, I I used to be a big fan of the car. I've had some nice cars in the past, and um, now I I I think cars are very very problematic. 
I think they're extremely problematic in cities and towns, probably villages as well, um, because they, they endanger people, they consume energy, uh, and they occupy a huge amount of space. And the reason why I mention this here is because those parklets occupy two car parking spaces because so much of cities are harboring cars that aren't used. They're, they're sitting there, these big expensive assets are sitting there and there's two, two cars in two spaces, usually with one person in each. So that there's two people that can, can sit there. And this park, the parklets sit on the, pl the footprint of those two spaces. So they are, I don't know, 11 meters long and about 2.4 meters wide. And there's a big planted fringe to it to visually as well as orally protect people a little bit that sit in those parklets from the, the traffic that's moving along that road. But actually, you know, if, if, if in a, an era where we don't have to socially distance, I would imagine you probably get about 15, 20 people in one of those modules, you know, in a micro park. Whereas actually, you know, previously there's two, two car drivers are now saying, oh, I can't park my car anywhere. Well, actually there's, there's a dozen people having some fun. And the, the reason why they're there is because the licensing laws nationally change so that uh, the, the, uh, the liquor license, so the drink, the alcohol license or the food license and, and so on has been relaxed so that um, people can sit outside a cafe, a restaurant, a coffee house. Um, a big, at the moment, they can't easily go in. So it, it's, it's a, a rapid response. Um, so, so I, I, I used to say, I said last year when the city council didn't really like the design, I was going, this isn't top of my design agenda, but is, it is top of the social agenda and the economic agenda. Because if these, a lot of these small restaurants and coffee houses are independent. So the, the business improvement district paid for these to be, to be installed. We only did six, we've done six so far. It was, it was a response to, it was, an, it was a rapid e uh, economic response and a health response to how a city can still stay, stay alive because the big the big cities in the UK, London, Birmingham, Manchester, the core of the cities have been more social, more economically impacted than a lot of the neighborhoods because a lot of us are now where I'm, I mean, in neighborhood three miles from the city center. My high street's quite well used, but I don't go into the city center. So that it's, it's a way of encouraging that as well. So it's, it's a small project, as you, as you say, but actually has quite a significant impact, I think. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Neha? Yeah. Hi, Philip. Thanks for this wonderful journey. Um, I had one question for you. Uh, since you have, you know, played multiple roles, worn several hats as, you know, in the public life, in the uh, private sector, and, you know, in the service sector as such. So which phase of your journey did you feel most empowered to make a change or to contribute a change in the public realm or to say in the, de in the democratic spaces, as you said in your presentation? Um, it was one, it's one that I was able to illustrate least because I, I haven't got uh, all the material from the time I was there. I was only there for 18 months, but it was the shift I made from design practice through into before I went to the city council, which was when I was running, I was director of Midlands Architecture, the design environment made. That was a convenient acronym. Um, and that, that actually was a, a regional role. So it went up towards Manchester, off into towards the Welsh borders. Uh, so it's a very big footprint. And we were working with school teachers. We were working with public artists. Um, we were working with local authorities. We would try to work with house builders, although they're the, they're the biggest dinosaurs. They ought to be dying, really, but they're still alive. Um, and um, that, that was empowering because there was one and a half people in the organisation. So we were absolutely tiny but we were running events across the whole of that region. And, and um, I hope this doesn't sound egotistical, but I, I would find myself sitting next to the regional director of the government office for that whole place and the regional director for 
um, something called the Regional Development Agency, which they, they were they were spending sort of several hundred millions of pounds each year on infrastructure and projects. So, but, but we were seen as a regional organisation, and so that was um, that was a, that was um, you know I'd gone from some of my private practice was actually refurbishing because um, it was I was a one man business. I was refurbishing en suite bathrooms in an old people's home and I thought I've been to university for seven years to to be doing to doing this and I suddenly shifted into this much more role that suited me in my heart it suited me in my ability to communicate and to talk and to arrange events and to cajole people into doing things and that was a launch pad to, to going into um, the public sector but the interesting thing about the public sector was a huge shock. Not, not only was I dealing with those big, big plans, and previously I've been doing really small things, um, but also you, you kind of have to swallow your... I mean, every architect has got, got an ego, and my work isn't particularly... I don't think it's particularly egotistical. It, it's very much about facilitating things for people. You know, your name isn't on a street, your name isn't on a square, your name isn't on a park. You're quite invisible, actually, because you enabled it to happen. You, you weren't the designer. But when you move into the public sector, you have to swallow the ego anyway, because the actual decision makers, it goes back to democracy, are politicians. So the politicians want to do something like move a library or don't want to do something like the, some of the things I wanted to do. They are the commanders. They are the ones with the power you are actually, even though I was at a system director level. So that was actually a very, so a lot of architects couldn't handle working in the public sector because they don't like to be told what to do. They want to tell other people what they're going to do. And I think that's a really interesting dynamic. Uh, anyone from faculties, Ashna, Kronali, anyone, uh, Anjal? Uh, okay, anybody from students? Anybody has a question? Pavani, Ninas, Priyam, Avnish. Okay, sir. Uh, hi, I'm Ninas and I'm from fifth year. So, sir, I have a small question for you. First of all, thank you for showing us a beautiful journey of your practice. So basically, sir, how has been architecture and the manner you look at it evolved considering the educational and the recreational zone during the last three decades of your urban practices? Uh, so, so, so um, thank you. Uh, are, you do, are you sort of asking whether my, my looking at architecture and appreciation of architecture has, has changed and evolved over time? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yes, yeah, sir. okay. Yeah, very interesting. Um, I think I am much more engaged by context. Um, when I was at university, um, the, the heroic was admired. And I think whilst I still deliberately go out of my way to look at, you know, some great new peace um i i have a huge admiration for the unsung the appropriate the uh contextual so i i, I actually think that the best designers understand landscape topography context planning and policy and ideas and economy um, and the respond to those in, in, in a still, still a creative and fascinating way. And I think I, I have a huge admiration for people that can deal with that than the big strident, shiny object. Um, and I think that's partly an aging process. So my photography is, is about the demure, the, the shabby, the matte rather than the gloss and, um, and I think that reflects my my own character as well, really, because you come out of university, you think you're going to change the world, and some people do. I didn't. I just influenced one or two good things to happen. I think some of them are good, some of them are not so good. So um, 
that that's a sort of conceptual answer to your question rather than being specific about a style or indeed a material. Thank you. Anyone else from Zoom room? Anyone else? Pamni, Priyam? Okay, then I have a question, Philip. There is a student on uh, YouTube and uh, her name is Shelly. She's a landscape student. She's doing bachelor's in landscape architecture. And uh, she has a question for you. She's asking, uh, hello, sir. I would like to know your point of view about while designing public spaces, would you prefer restoration of the landscape that has disappeared or make a new landscape which would be liked by people? Like, would you choose the likings of the people or what environment needs? I think there's two, thank you, Shadi. I think there's two bits to that question. Um, th th let's deal with the, the liking bit second. I think the, the, what I admire, and I think I've said this in, answer that previous question slightly is if you understand the texture and the form of what's gone before that might be covered over in the interim but actually re-revealing some of that but doing it in a, a contemporary way that has respect but also has contemporary thinking, contemporary materials, contemporary approach. If you can do a blend, if you can do a synthesis of those two things, a better word, that's clever. And, that, and I think that's what comes out of a, of a good education in, in, in landscape and planning and architecture and so on, because you have, a, you have the ability, you, you develop the ability and the techniques to do those things. Now, I think, so for example, those contemporary parks that I mentioned, I think are good urban responses to their place. And some of them did pick up that the jewelry quarter one, if I remember rightly, sort of picked up some of the lines and roots and history because actually it was a car park. So what preceded the car park had much more relevance to a new space than a car park. Um, I think the, the point about like and or not, I think is probably talking about um, when you're doing a proposal, what, what, the, what the public view would be about what, what's most appropriate. Um, and I think that's a really hard one to answer because I, I've been slightly at odds sometimes with the public view. But what I've always done with the competitions that we've done is we, 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 we deliberately use the media, the, the news media, to publicise them because that helps you get an understanding of the project out there and appreciation of it and, and it provokes interest. Um, because so many things, you know, just happen without a lot of public interjection. Um, so we would always have a public vote, but then we would have an expert panel, and sometimes I'd be on that panel, to actually choose the winner. And I think expert panels bring expert perspectives and don't always agree with the public vote. Sometimes they do. So I think it's actually a hard one because, you know, um, public justifying to the public a choice that wasn't their choice is 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 the matter of um, academic debate. I've lost your audio. Can you hear me? Yeah, I lost you. You're on mute. You're on mute uh, oh, sorry. So thank you, Philip. Uh, it was uh, very well comprehended, and I think you did answer Shaggy's query. Um, I don't know. I don't have any more questions. Uh, Pragya, do you have? Uh, Anjil, Pragya, uh, anyone? You have got any questions from students? Yes. Nothing on YouTube. Okay. Yeah, uh, ma'am. Actually, I don't have any question, but I would like to thank him to give a new perspective and a very interesting uh, talk. So I really enjoyed your session. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Uh, Philip Angel uh, is uh, actually an alumni uh, of this. Uh, she's from the first batch of uh, SEDA and now she is uh, working with us. She's a colleague now with us. So no, she, no, no. Yeah. Good. Good. Uh, so I think if we do not have any more questions, uh, Pratush, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, just I just wanted to thank you, Phillips. Uh, this is uh, this has been a wonderful evening for us. I think uh, it's afternoon there right now. Thanks for finding time. And uh, as you can see, there there are a lot of thoughts, a lot of questions that are coming in people's mind. And I, uh, I mean, what I can really say is, uh, we have really provoked uh, many of us to to think about architecture and urban spaces. And come to think of it, uh, in a country like India, it's a very, very challenging time because these are transforming very fast. And I think uh, in these times to look at uh, parallel examples from other parts of the world, uh, the pressures of development are very high. And like any other you know, fast developing economies, cities that grow fast continue to grow faster. The rest of the cities tend to kind of grow off of the grid. So a lot of things for us to think about, and I'm sure the young students listening to this presentation, uh, it was actually wonderful to see how, I won't the word you wrote, but uh, I like that whole comparison of the heroics that one would aspire for while you were studying in architecture schools and how I mean, so much has changed and how you thinking about context. Okay. And that's also a big shift that has happened in the profession. Um, and thanks for, thanks for doing this for us. Thanks for opening yourself up. It's been also a personal journey of sorts, I can see it. And well, um, one day, I hope you. to see our mm -hmm. wonderful uh, <laughs> encased concrete in yes. real, uh, you know, in real space. Yep. Yes. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you. And thanks really for listening, as it's a privilege to be able to uh, have an audience and, uh, and, and and put the whole thing together, which I hadn't done before. So it's been a lovely exercise. So, And it's just nice that people want to hear some of it. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.